In this video, we're looking at 1 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 13, the sermon I preached from the section I called, Who Cares? My hope and prayer in these videos is that they will be useful, that they will give you tools so that you can be better equipped to dig into God's glorious word for yourself, that you might be able to teach it well to others. And a very important tool in uh, any time you come to a passage is to think about context. And in 1 Timothy 3, uh, we need to remember what has come before. And the key passages just to remember with, within the 1 Timothy context is chapter 1 verse 15 and chapter 2 verse 3 and 4. They kind of give us the heartbeat of why Paul is writing this letter. He gives the first of his trustworthy sayings in 1 verse 15. And he tells us that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then in chapter 2 verse 3 and 4, he tells us that God our Savior wants all people to be saved. And so it is the salvation of all people that really is at the heart of this letter and this passage is now going to help us to th think about who will best serve the church to make sure that they keep this message of salvation through Jesus at the center of the church. Now, if you haven't already done so, as always, I encourage you to take some time, read through the passage yourself a number of times. There is no substitute for reading and rereading and reading again the passage that you're working in. And as you read, you'll notice uh, key ideas that are repeated, uh, important things uh, or questions might arise as you read through the passage. So please do that work yourself. Spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand his glorious word. Pray that this would be more than just an academic exercise, that you would be rejoicing in the privilege of hearing God speak through his word, that his spirit would take these truths and transform you and pray that as you teach these truths to others, that God would indeed use his word to transform his people. And as always, I'm going to just highlight some of the key things that I've uh, seen in this passage and I hope that this will be useful to you too. Just to start with, verse 5 here I think is very important for us to look at to help us understand the big reason why Paul writes this about overseers and deacons. And the key in verse 5 is this idea of taking care of God's church. Paul says, if an overseer doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? So this is at the heart of everything that Paul says in this section in chapter 1, he began by saying that false teachers were coming in and he wanted Timothy to stop those false teachers because they were promoting things that weren't advancing God's work. And Paul wants Timothy and he wants all of his readers to know how to best take care of God's very precious church, the church who Christ Jesus came into the world to save, the church who are made up of saved sinners. And so now reading this whole section with this idea in our minds helps us to clarify exactly why Paul highlights the things that he does. And he starts with this trustworthy saying. Uh, now Paul uses these trustworthy sayings uh, a couple of times in the pastoral letters. And it's like saying, here's something super important. Don't miss this. The trustworthy saying in chapter 1 verse 15 was Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And now this trustworthy saying is linked with that. Uh, Paul is speaking to overseers who have been tasked with this important task of caring for these sinners who Christ came to save. And so in this section, we see Paul speaking of different kinds of leaders. He speaks about overseers and he speaks about deacons. And as we look at these lists of qualifications for overseers and deacons, in both of the lists, the very important thing to see is that character trumps competence. So character trumps competence. Keep that in mind as we look at these 
different qualifications for both overseers and deacons. Now you'll see that there are a number of things that overlap in these lists. So faithful to his wife, faithful to his wife, therefore both the overseer and the deacon. Temperate is mentioned here for uh, the overseer and it is mentioned here for the women or the wives. We'll have a look at that in a moment. So he's managing his family in a manner worthy of full respect and we see that the women are also called to be worthy of respect um, as well as the deacons themselves worthy of respect. We also see here not given to drunkenness and not indulging in much wine. You see that he must be able to manage his own family or his own household uh, so manage his children and his household well is an idea that's also repeated. In the overseers list, we see that a top and tails with above reproach, he says here, and a good reputation with outsiders. So you just see that uh, the way that he conducts himself uh, needs to be not just um, within the church, but even with the watching world, how they look in, uh, he needs to have a good reputation. Now, when we think of the overseer specifically, the very word stresses the role of watching over something. And we see here that we, it is somebody who watches over God's church. So somebody who is watching over, taking care of something that's very precious. And something that we see in the list for overseers that's not there in the list for deacons is this idea of being able to teach. That is a vital prerequisite. The problem is in the church, we often think about the overseer just as the preacher, and we don't see this reality as importantly as uh, Paul does. In this list, he also does in, in 2 Timothy 2 and Titus 1, and then Peter also says in 1 Peter 5, you see this reality that character trumps competence. So yes, they need to be able to teach, but around that ability to teach are all character traits. See, his life needs to be so shaped by the truth that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, that he is one of those sinners who's rejoicing in Jesus. Jesus is his hero, and that impacts the way that he lives. And that should then impact what he teaches, but his life needs to match what he's teaching. So he's someone who is temperate, self-controlled, respectable and hospitable. So that's somebody who is welcoming and warm and somebody who you would be happy to leave your loved ones with because you know they'll look after them well. Not somebody who's given to drunkenness or violence or quarrelsome or a lover of money. So they need to watch their, their words, watch their anger, uh, watch their greed and not be somebody who is a, a drunkard. In verse 6 and 7, there's this repeated idea of, um, he links it with the devil, yeah, the devil's trap. And he says, so it mustn't be somebody who's a recent convert, or pride might grab hold of them, and they fall under the same judgment as the devil. And also, they need to have a good reputation with outsiders, so that they won't fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. And Paul is just highlighting here how the devil is at work to try and bring down God's much-loved church. And if the devil can bring down the overseers of that church, it can very easily have a detrimental effect on this much-loved church. So don't put in somebody who is a recent convert. They need to be shown uh, through the test of time that their faith is genuine, that they are indeed living as somebody who is above reproach, with a good reputation for outs if, uh, with outsiders, and that's something that takes time to develop. And this very interesting section, verse 4 and 5, uh, Paul says, if you want to know if they are going to be a good overseer, go visit them at home. Spend time with them. Is he managing his own family well? Uh, is he working at helping his kids to obey him? Is he doing that in a manner worthy of full respect? The faithful to his wife falls under this. It's within his, uh, his family or his household. 
And then Paul says, if he doesn't know how to do that with his family, then he's not going to be able to take care of God's church very well. So Paul is saying, go into their home, see how they manage things there. That'll be a really good indication if this will be somebody who will be worthy of caring for God's church, who Christ Jesus came into the world to die for, God's much-loved church. Now, this role of overseers is, is only a role that is given to specific men, qualified male elders. So it's a tiny subset of all men. And these are the, the men who are to lead through their teaching and by their life as they deeply care, with great joy, caring for God's church. And then Paul turns to the deacons. Um, the word deacon simply means servant, and they are to serve alongside the overseers as servants helping to take care of God's church. Now, the one key difference, as I showed, that able to teach is a prerequisite, a qualification for overseers. It's not here in the list for deacons, but what we do see is that deacons must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. So although they don't need to be able to teach, they need to be well taught. The ESV translates this, as uh, keep hold of the mystery, uh, which is the same word that Paul uses in a number of his letters, most notably in uh, Colossians, where he speaks of this mystery that was hidden, that's now revealed, the mystery that the whole Bible is about, that finds its climax in Christ Jesus, who came into the world to save sinners. And he's saying that deacons need to hold tightly to that truth, they need to hold on to their faith in Jesus with a clear conscience. They are to live truth-shaped lives. And Paul says they need to be tested. Their lives need to be evaluated, which again shows it's not a recent convert. It's somebody who has stood the test of time. Their, their track record has been seen over time that they are somebody who is worthy of respect not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain. They hold tightly to the truth of the gospel. And as they are tested, then they are put forward to serve as deacons. So servants helping to care for God's church. Now, the interesting thing here in verse 11 is also something that isn't mentioned for the overseers. It says, in the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but trustworthy and temperate and trustworthy in everything. Now, the Greek word here can be translated as wife as well. So in the same way, the women or the wives are to be worthy of respect. Now, there is a lot of debate around this. Is this talking about the wives of deacons? Is it talking about women who are serving as deacons? So deaconesses. Is it simply just talking about women who are serving in deacon-like ways, but are just a part of those who are serving to take care of God's church? And there is much debate, much has been written about this, and you can go and do a whole lot of searching and come to your own conclusion on that one. I'm not going to try and solve that debate in this short video, but what I do want to point out is that these women are within the section of deacons. So on either side of verse 11, it's talking about deacons. So they are seen as serving in some way within the church to help take care of God's church. And in the same way, their character trumps their competence. So they need to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers. Uh, that word is devilish. So linking with the devil's trap here, their, their words mustn't be devil-like, deceptive. They need to be temperate or self-controlled, sober-minded and trustworthy in everything. So these are women whose character trumps their competence as they seek to joyfully care for God's church, helping the overseers in whatever way is possible. And then Paul comes back to uh, deacons themselves saying he must be faithful to his wife, same as the overseer, 
He must manage his children, his household well, just like the overseer. And those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance. This word assurance can also be translated as confidence. Great assurance or confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. And this word for confidence is is used uh, throughout the New Testament to show a confidence in them speaking about Jesus. So they should be confident in this mystery of their faith, that they're holding tightly, that they know with a clear conscience, and they want to speak about it whenever they have the opportunity. Confidence in their faith in Christ Jesus. What these men are doing is making sure that Christ Jesus is the hero of their own lives, the hero of their own story, the hero in the church in which they serve, and they want to confidently speak about him. So just with verse 5 at the center, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? That's what's at the heart of this. We want overseers whose character is very clear to be seen. They have a good reputation with outsiders. They are above reproach. As they teach, their lives back up their teaching. It's very clear from their lives and their teaching that Jesus is their hero and they want Jesus to be the hero in God's church of whom they have been set as overseers. And the deacons in the same way are helping the overseers to care deeply for God's church. They want Jesus to be the hero in the church and he's seen to be the hero in their lives. These are the type of leaders who we should be looking for in the church. As sadly, the history of the church and even current stories of leaders in the church show that we often fall short of this. And so for all Christians, an outflow of this should be that we want to pray for leaders who will actually uh, live up to this, who God would so use in a powerful way to care for his church as they seek to put the spotlight on Christ Jesus who came into the world to save sinners. This Jesus is their hero. They want him to be the hero in their church. And so as you continue to think about this, I encourage you to pray for your leaders. And pray that God would keep raising up more and more leaders who would love him, who would love his church for whom Christ died, and who would want more and more people to come to know Jesus. And if you are somebody in leadership within a church, I pray that you would look for others who will hold you accountable, who would keep reminding you of the gospel, that you yourself would keep reminding yourself of the gospel, and pray that if people do point out areas of your life that aren't matching up, pray that God by his spirit would be at work within you, uh, transforming you to be more like Jesus, so that Jesus will increasingly be the hero in your own heart and the hero in the church in which you serve. Well, God bless as you dig in further.